And hold on just one moment. Stop share. I need to do one little adjustment here. Be patient with me. Start slideshow from the beginning. There we go. And I'm coming back. Technology, right? If you had a MacBook, it'd just be so much easier. Oh, if I had a MacBook, I don't know that I'd be able to do this. I was in service recently, and I can't remember who was speaking, Brother Johnson. It might have been you. And um, somebody read from first peter chapter one and it was just the introduction and i want to look at this right now and then i'm going to scroll um further in for the lesson that i put together but as as i was looking at this introduction peter an apostle of jesus christ to the strangers scattered throughout pontus galatia cappadocia asia and Bithynia, I've been reading this Bible for almost 50 years. And I looked at that verse and I thought, how in the world did I ever miss that? And that's what I'd like to talk about a little bit um, this evening. So I'm gonna go back to the beginning just for a moment. And I didn't have a whole lot of time to prepare this. And so that's why I'm a, a little bit kludgy getting through this, but I think I can do it. Okay, here we are. As the first century church was formed, it appears the gospel message went into different regions via three main methods. There's three ways that the gospel got out. And um, Jesus told us that we're supposed to preach the gospel, that we're supposed to share the message, we're supposed, we're supposed to witness, we're supposed to, to do all of these things. And then we, as we look at the book of Acts, we see that this was done primarily in three ways. First of all, there was new converts at Pentecost. There were thousands who received a Pentecostal experience because they were in Jerusalem for a festival, for a feast. And they were there for days, maybe a week, maybe a couple of weeks if they had friends and relatives there. But ultimately, they went back home. And in leaving Jerusalem, they, they went with a small amount of information, a Pentecostal experience, and their sins remitted by being baptized. It says thousands were baptized. That at that time. But these were new converts. These were serious babes in Christ, and they started to spread the gospel and talk to people as they, as they went. There was no established ministry. There were no churches for them to go to. Then later on, as the church progressed, we find that there were planned mission trips by apostles such as Paul who in the well-established congregation in Antioch um, had the elders lay hands on him and they ordained him and they sent him along with the traveling companion out with specific instructions and I would think ministry tools to, to go and do the work that Jesus Christ has sent the church to do. And then ultimately from that, we find that there were disciples of men like Paul or Peter and others who then started to preach the gospel, second generation ministry, if you could have it. So does that all make sense? Yeah. Okay. We need to realize these groups were different from one another. And they were divided along cultural and religious heritage lines that could quickly lead to disputes and divisions in the body of Christ. You can imagine someone from Pentecost who went to a particular city and started living their Christian life, a couple years later, suddenly run across a well-seasoned, smooth-talking preacher from the Bible College in Antioch. 
and they want to sit down over coffee and start discussing Bible and things. And like one of them is going to seem very knowledgeable, very understanding. And the other one is going to be, well, I never heard that. I never heard that. Um, I, 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 you know, and I picked this up from this guy. I picked a little up from there. And there could be a lot of disunity in the body of Christ over that. And so the early solution given by the Spirit, and this may be shocking, but we've got a lot of mature people here, so I'm just going to say it. The early solution given by the Spirit seems to be keeping them separate, to allow them to grow in grace and the Word before they were mixed together as one church. Now, that's the crux of my message, but I'm going to build on that particular thought. The early solution given by the Spirit seems to be keeping them separate separate. Let's take a look at Acts chapter 6, verse 9. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and the Cyrenians, and the Alexandrians. These were different Jewish believing groups, synagogues, that's the Old Testament church, if you could have it that way. The early Christians used to meet in synagogues. They used to go to the synagogues. The Apostle Paul in his travels would go to synagogues. Jesus, when he got up to, to, to minister, ministered in a synagogue. And there was a mixing together in the early church of Jews and believers in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And some of these synagogues have historically been known as hotbeds of debate. They love to argue about things. And these particular synagogues here, and it's the Libertines, the Cyrenians, the Alexandrians, and them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen, arguing with Stephen about stuff. Now, I don't know that in any of these particular synagogues there were believers in Christ or not. That's really not the point. The point I'm getting at is they love to argue. They disputed with Stephen to the point they killed him. This is where Stephen was murdered over a doctrinal issue. Stephen became the first martyr over issues that came out of his teachings from the book of Moses. And as he began to expound his understanding of scripture, these people got madder and madder. And finally, it just blew up. They gnashed it with their teeth. And Acts, and I got to move you guys off my screen here. Hang on. In Acts 16, verse 6, it says, Now when they had gone throughout Pergia and the region of Galatia and forbidden and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. It says, and them in, at the top of the screen there, them of Cilicia in Asia, disputing. But here we see that the Apostle Paul and his ministry group were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to go into Asia. And after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia. Now they want to go to Bithynia. And the Holy Ghost says, no. Now I've heard a lot of different things on this in my years. You know, I've heard preachers go so far as to say, well, you know, God didn't want the gospel to go to Asia. Or for some reason, God didn't want, you know, the gospel to go into Bithynia. I'm going to question that thinking right now. And I'm going to propose the gospel that already gone there. And if the Apostle Paul went in there and started preaching, it would have been nothing but trouble. There would have been nothing but arguments, nothing but debates, and it would have caused further division in the body of Christ. It would have slowed down the ministry of the Apostle Paul to go out and start new churches. He would have gotten bogged down in nothing more than a waste of time and a waste of spiritual energy. And so, therefore, the Holy Ghost said, don't do it. As the church grew, the leadership was forced to address the cultural and even doctrinal differences between the groups of born-again believers. I got to move you guys off my screen again. Hang on. This process was at times painfully resolved through discussions, councils, letters of explanation that required teachings to be conducted among the believers. The church was growing. New congregations were being brought to birth. 
new members were coming in. They were coming in from the Jewish faith. They were coming in from the non-Jewish faith. They were coming in from the pagan faith. They were coming in from all sorts of different areas. And as these people came together, it became the job of the ministry to try to get the knot out of the shoelace, if I can put it simple, and try to resolve these problems. And they did that through a series of methods. And I got them written here, councils, letters of explanation, and deep teaching among the people so that they would understand these things. And take a look here at Acts chapter 15. It says, and certain men came down from Judea, taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, can you imagine somebody coming into one of our churches today, getting up to preach? I wonder how our church leaders would handle something like that. You know, we can handle it if they say, you got to repent. You have to be baptized in Jesus' name. You need to receive the Holy Ghost. You need to live a holy life. But if someone says, no, you have to become a Jew. Whoa, we're not going to tolerate that. But there were people in the body of Christ that honestly believed that. Now, therefore, Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem onto the apostles and elders about this question. These differences started to become apparent as the different church groups started to interact with one another. The apostle Paul writes this, and notice it's to the Galatians. And that we looked at the map at the beginning was the Galatians. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, for there be some that trouble you. There be some that trouble you were actually people in the church. There be some that trouble you were actually teachers in some of the churches. Those that were troubling them were leaders in congregations that had picked up teachings and beliefs that were not right. But they thought they were right. And some of these may have come out of the Pentecostal revival, where these Jews, after receiving the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, after being baptized, went back to their synagogues, went back to their cities, and were separated from good teaching until ministry was able to come to them, sometimes many years later. Let's take a look at this very interesting verse in Galatians 2.9. It speaks concerning James, and I've highlighted Peter, because we're going to talk about Peter in just a bit, and John, who seem to be leaders. They recognized that God had given me, and this is Paul writing, this special task. What special task did Paul have? So they shook hands with Barnabas and me as a sign that we were all partners. And we agreed that Barnabas and I would work among the Gentiles and they among the Jews. It was determined that they were literally going to split the effort along these cultural and doctrinal divisions that were happening within the body of Christ. They said, Paul, you and Barnabas, you go work with those groups. We're going to work with our group over here. And good luck to you. We shook hands and off we went. For a time, it almost seemed that there were two or more folds. And I'm talking about sheep. And I love the, I love the pictures in the Bible of what the church is like. And the church is like sheep. But sheep by themselves do not constitute a flock. And so these particular sheep congregated around their cultural and doctrinal agreements, and they separated along lines of cultural and doctrinal differences. And it looked like it was going to stay that way. Is the church going to be multiple folds? No. But in reality, there were multiple flocks. And I want you to notice the difference between those two words. There's a big difference between a fold and a flock. Over time, 
the prohibition of ministry crossover was lifted by the spirit. This I see. Siri's talking to me. Go away, Siri. <laughs> Over time, the prohibition of ministry crossover was lifted by the Spirit. And Paul, who was instructed to stay away from some areas, was able to freely minister in them. And that's where this thing hit me from Peter's epistle. Peter's epistle seems to highlight a full merging of these diverse groups in what is today known as modern Turkey. This epistle is filled with admonitions to mature and move forward. So let's take a look at some verses here. Genesis 29, 2. And behold, a well in the field, and lo, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. What does three flocks of sheep look like? That's three flocks of sheep right there. What does three flocks of sheep mean? Well, it can mean many things. It can mean three owners, or it can mean three different foremen, all working for the same owner, but the sheep are being kept separate from each other for various reasons. Possibly they don't want them to interbreed because one has brown hair, the other has curly hair, one has thick wool, the other one is being raised for the meat that it provides. What, whatever the reasons are, these sheep are being kept separate from each other, and they are being divided up into flocks. They're not allowed to mingle together. Look at this verse in Isaiah 65, 10. Sharon shall be a fold of flocks. It doesn't say Sharon shall be a fold of sheep. A fold of flocks. Like I said, we need to understand the difference between a fold and a flock. I've got a picture here of a flock of sheep in a fold. But this is just a flock in a fold. If it was a fold of flocks, it would look like this. A fold of flocks is an enclosure, because that's what a fold is. It's an enclosure that is able to handle multiple flocks. And Sharon shall be a fold with multiple flocks. Everyone's very familiar with this particular verse. And so let's take a look at this. Jesus said, And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Catch that. He didn't say this field. He didn't say this flock. He said this fold, this enclosure. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. There shall be one fold and one shepherd. And this is the purpose and the plan of God for the church. One fold. But he doesn't say one flock. So what I've got here is three pictures to help us understand this. The first little guy here, that is not a flock, that is not a fold, that is a dinner. A sheep in a field is considered dinner to any wild animal. And so what we see here, this lonely little sheep all by himself, without a flock and without a fold, is not going to survive the night. He's dinner. But down below, we see sheep in a flock. When you see sheep in a flock, that speaks of stewardship. Somebody has taken the stewardship to manage that flock, that group of sheep. And these sheep are together because of commonality. Often when we think of churches today, we think of churches that are going to be divided by locality. The church in Puyallup, the church in Kent, the church in Seattle, the church in Bremerton. And we understand there's only one church, 
but we also understand that there are shepherds over each of these individual flocks because we are separated by distance. Now, we could be separated by language, but in the early days of Christianity, they were separated by doctrinal issues. They were separated by cultural issues. And these are sheep in a flock. They all look pretty much alike. And what we see over here on the right is sheep in a fold. The difference is sheep in a flock speaks, speaks of stewardship. Sheep in a fold speaks of ownership. Jesus is the master shepherd. He is the chief shepherd. He's the one who owns all the flocks, and he's the one that owns the fold. Let's get back to this. This stuck out to me so clearly the other day. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout, I've got them highlighted here in red, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Peter is writing to the Apostle Paul's converts. When I, when I saw that, it hit me like, like, like a, a load of bricks. These are the Apostle Paul's the fruit of his ministry. These are his churches. And Peter had agreed that he was going to work among the Jews, and Paul was going to work among these others. But a point here, Peter crossed over and wrote to the Apostle Paul's converts. What does that say? Let's take a look here again. At Jerusalem, for the first Pentecost, there were Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, or Cappadocia, if you want to say it that way, Pontus, and Asia. And again, you can see them on the map. Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia. These are people that went back home and didn't get a lot of teaching. Paul's missionary ministry... Now, when they had gone throughout Persia in the region of Galatia, you can see that on the map, were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. You can see Asia there. Acts 16. After they had come to Mysia, they essayed to go to Bithynia. You see it on the map. But the Spirit suffered them not. However, notice... In Acts chapter 18, and there's a time frame between these chapters and Acts. Sometimes we read them so fast, we think the book of Acts happened in a 24-hour period. It happened in a lifetime of an apostle. And as time progressed, strong workers became available. Acts 18, 2, it says, And found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, up there by Bithynia. That's where he was from. Lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. How did he get into the Pentecostal experience? Possibly he was there at the day of Pentecost. It doesn't say. But there were those from the day of Pentecost in Pontus. Maybe he got converted by somebody who received the Pentecostal experience from Jerusalem. We just don't know. But ultimately, this Christian from Pontus started to mingle, and he was a strong player, if I can put it that way. Acts 18, we move into the chapter. After he had spent some time there, he departed, and this is speaking of the Apostle Paul, and went over all the country of Galatia and Persia in order to strengthen all the disciples. I believe that it keys on the words overall. He's going everywhere now, and he's strengthening all the disciples. Previously, he would have limited his ministry to a certain group of disciples. But now something's happened, 
and the Apostle Paul is going everywhere and ministering to everyone. A change had happened. Acts 19, and this continued in Ephesus by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jew and Greek. And again, I, I want you to notice that it's, it's calling out that not just the Jews are hearing the gospel, not just the Greeks, and it doesn't seem to be separating them other than letting us know that the Jews and Greeks are getting the gospel now, and they're getting it in Asia, and who's giving it to them? Paul. But in Acts 16, if you look up on the page, we were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. But if you look at the map, Ephesus is in the region called Asia. Acts 19.22. So he sent unto Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus. But he himself, Paul, stayed in Asia for a season. Can you see during the lifetime in the ministry of the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul, things began to change within the church of Jesus Christ? Through strong teaching, through ministry, through counseling, through conferences, through prayer, through the anointing of God's Spirit, the church that was divided and could have stayed divided forever, instead started to become united. I got to thinking about this concerning the disunity in our world today. It seems that we are going in every direction, whether it be culturally, whether it be politically, whether it be socially, we are being pulled apart and we're even being pulled apart within the body of Christ. But honestly, folks, I believe that the ministry of the word and the spirit can serve to pull us together, when everything seems to want to pull us apart. Nothing could have been more divisive than 2,000 years ago, the environment that the church found itself in. But within a generation, men like Paul and Peter and James and John were able to take the disunity and bring it to a place of unity. Let's take a look at Peter's teaching along these lines. So he wrote this epistle to Paul's converts, and this is what he had to say. As obedient children, now we have to realize we're children. Children, now listen here, children. Do not fashion yourself according to the former lusts. Now, lust does not always have to speak of sexual desire. It's the things that you were really passionate about the things that really got your hot button, the things that you really cared about, the things that meant so much to you. Now you have become children in Christ. Don't go back to that stuff because it was in your ignorance that you cared about those things. And again, in chapter two, as newborn babes, again, he says, you have to realize we have been given by Christ in salvation, in the new birth, a new start. We can't go back to being what we were. We can't fall back on the excuse, well, that's just the way I am. I'm a Swede, or I'm a German, or I'm, I'm an Italian. I've got a temper. Or I'm, you know, we can't do that. We are no longer what we were. We have been born again, and our old nature has to die. And we who were not a people... They were not a people. They were Jews. They were Gentiles. They were pagans. They were Romans. They were people from Babylon. They were many peoples, but they were not a people. But in the body of Christ during that first generation, they became a people. That which should have been so divided by every standard became so united, and the, the church was able to do it in a generation. Chapter 3, he says, be ye all of one mind. You got to think alike. You got to have that unity. On the day of Pentecost, for just a couple of hours, it says they were all of one mind and one accord. And then, boom, off they went. <laughs> but somehow the church pulled it back together again. Be ye all of one mind. And then down in verse 10, let him refrain his tongue 
from evil. And evil there is not necessarily just speaking about swearing or, or saying bad gossipy things. It's hurtful things. Don't say things that are going to hurt the body of Christ. Don't say things that are going to bring division into the body of Christ. Speak love, speak unity, speak something that's going to pull us together rather than to draw us apart. Now, that doesn't mean that we live a life of compromise. I mean, my friends know that I don't compromise on much of anything. But the way you say it can either be healing or hurting. But let none of you suffer. And the word suffer there again is not necessarily talking about sore back, but it's talking about be punished as. Don't any of you ever be guilty of being a busybody in other men's matters. There are some things we just need to stay away from. This is none of my business. I heard a long time ago, if I'm not a part of the problem, I'm probably not a part of the solution. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And this is so key. It was time, he said, that the house of God comes into this place of judgment. But it's not a judgment to hurt us. It's a judgment to heal us. It's a judgment to bring us together and to put an end to the wrongs. And notice how he ends this epistle. Feed the flock of God. It seems in Peter's mind, with the writing to Paul's converts, that he realized, I'm bringing the church together. That which had been separated under the ministry of Paul and Barnabas and Silas, and I'm over here with James and the other uh, apostles, we have to be brought together. Feed the flock of God. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. All of these things are speaking of spiritual maturing and unity and growing in the gospel as Christians. Going back, and I'm just about done here. Jesus said, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. There shall be one fold and one shepherd. And some of the very last words that Jesus spoke to Peter, do you love me? He then said unto him, feed my sheep. First Peter 5, 2, feed the flock of God. Well, that's pretty much what I've got to say, brother. And I don't have visibility in my watch, so I'm not sure how much time you've got, but I'm going to hand it back over to you, brother. Well, we have the rest of the night. There's no <laughs> I want us to first take a moment here and pray. Um, there is, there's very obviously, and there has been for a, a while, uh, a, a spirit of division in our world. I mean, it's it's rampant. Um, and uh, I, you know, one of the things that has stood out to me is that uh, people can't just disagree anymore. You know, it's it's okay to disagree. I I I can disagree with your stance on a subject or a matter. I can disagree with your favorite sports team. I can even disagree with your favorite food, and that's okay. But this spirit of division in our world today has escalated to the point where if somebody disagrees with you, it's like there's, there's a hatred towards them. Cancel culture. Yeah, and, and, and right down to even causing harm. You've seen in the last few months uh, different situations that have unfolded through the the civil unrest in our country where people have murdered each other and felt justified in it well i can do that because they disagree with me and how i feel and it's like wow but all that said don't think for a moment that that same spirit isn't doing its best to work its way into the church well i guarantee you there are churches right now pentecostal churches that are being split over these things 
and people are leaving leaving the church because somebody in the pew across from them has a different view on something all the time yeah and and i never thought i would be at this place you know i mean <clears throat> we always say that but i i mean that sincerely that that in 2020 these would be some of the issues that would divide the church i don't believe that's the plan of god but i believe that there's there's spirits at work in the earth that are they're they're dividing people it ought not to divide the body of christ whether it be uh political issues whether it be social issues um spiritual issues biblical issues these things ought not to divide us um, now, if we're talking about spirit and truth and doctrine and, and things that are biblical truths, I, we stand upon those things. And if that if a biblical truth divides me from somebody, I, I mean, I have to let the Spirit of God do the work there. But we're talking about, in some places, opinions and view, viewpoints that are dividing people. So I want us to take a moment here and, and pray. I want us to pray one for another. And I want you to pray for your brother. I want you to pray for your sister. And I want you to pray that God would unify us and bring the church together in this hour. And I want you to take authority. I want you to bind a, the spirit of division that is rampant in the earth trying to work its way into the church and has worked its way to the church. And I want you to loose the spirit of unity. The, the scripture talks about the unity of the spirit, that bond of peace that brings us together, that puts us in the same fold. Let's agree together right now on these things. In the name of Jesus, be careful how distant you let yourself become. The enemy will plant seeds. I understand that not all of us are social butterflies. Not all of us are or extroverts and like to be out and connecting and, and in fellowship, but be careful how much you, you, you isolate yourself. I understand that for health reasons right now, some of us aren't able to get out and about and do things. Be careful about that. The enemy will use that isolation to bring separation spiritually. And you're going to begin to feel yourself disconnected from the body of Christ. That's not the will of God. That's not the purpose of God. I'm not saying you got together in big groups, but you need to find somebody to connect with, find somebody to fellowship. And if they got to sit on one side of the yard and you sit on the other side of the yard, there, I'm telling you, hear me today. There's something powerful in the fellowship of the body of Christ, that exchange that happens between the body, you ministering to me and me ministering to you. We might, we might be talking about bacon bread, Brother Kendrick, but there's ministry in the body of Christ through that. It's fellowship. Jesus said, and I don't think he was talking about Zoom, so don't even try to use that on me. Forsake not the gathering of yourselves together. I'm not even, I'm not even talking about that in, in, in the, the sense of church. I'm talking about isolation and, and keeping ourselves apart. Just I'm, I'm, I'm imploring you in the Holy Ghost tonight. Be careful in that. I, I want every individual under the sound of my voice to be saved. I want every individual on this call that I, and those that can't even be on the call, I want to see you saved. I want to see your family saved. I want to see the promises of God fulfilled in your life. And I, I've heard, I've heard throughout COVID, man, I just feel disconnected or I feel like I'm, I'm all alone or I feel isolated. That's not the will of God. And the enemy uses this time to drive a wedge or to start to separate us. And, and it, can, it can start out for good reason. I need to be careful or I'm, you know, I, I, I can't do this or I work in the health care industry so I can't be around people because I'm, I'm exposed every day to the fire. I understand all those things. Pray and ask the Lord to put somebody with you that's not afraid and is okay and can come spend time with you and fellowship. There's got to be some fellowship and connection. This, this screen is, uh, it's great to see your face, but it's just not the same. It's just not the same. Thank you, Brother Berglund, for sharing that with us tonight. That was, a, that was an amazing Bible study. Thank you. 
And I, I want to go back to something you said at the beginning. You said you've been reading the Bible for 50 years and you saw something new. That is a testament. An absolute testament. I see Brother Tom's over there shaking his head. That is a testament to why we read our Bibles every day because there's something new that God wants to show us. There's something new he wants to reveal to us no matter how long you've been reading it. There's things that he wants to show us. So you gave us a great Bible study on just reading your Bible. Brother Berglund, thank you for that. God bless you all. Uh, Brother Kendrick,